your own money in the business and you're trying to sell the business to these VCs, right? Um, it's, it's very stressful. I remember Series A like it was yesterday. You know, if you believe in your business and you believe in your, your market, you will find that investor. Alrighty, hello everyone, and welcome to the Deal Maker Show. So I'm very, very excited today. We have an amazing guest. It's incredible what they're doing. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun, really learning how he got started, how he built the business, financed it, scaled it, and uh, obviously being in a in a rocket ship. So I guess without further ado, let's welcome our guest today, Vishal Maria. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Alejandro. Great to be here, my friend. Thanks, thanks for taking the time. So originally born and raised there in the UK, but obviously I'm sure super inspired by your parents that uh, decided to go to the UK themselves from India. How was life growing up? Yeah, that was great, Alejandro. So yeah, you're absolutely spot on. So yeah, my parents came from India in the 60s. And um, yeah, no, I was born and brought up here in London. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was great fun, right? So my, my parents were entrepreneurs. Uh, my, my dad uh, had a number of um, superstores um so cash and carries here in here in london uh, across london from south to north and so on and yeah so i i really was sort of grown up brought up in in business uh really um so obviously had a great um academic academic career um obviously studied incredibly hard uh but yeah no i was always brought up in business um lots of conversations at the dinner table was about business I can imagine, and I'm sure that you learned quite a bit, but probably more than just learning the dogmatic side, you definitely learned the pragmatic side by working with your dad. So how was that for you? Yeah, it was really mum and dad, right? So they, they both were partners uh, together, and um, which was fascinating. Uh, but, you know, learning how to turn profit, uh, learning how to uh, ride, you know, both good waves and bad waves. Um, you know, we had a number of crashes during the 70s and 80s, um, and the 90s, um, you know, learned a lot from my dad on, on how to still run and build a business uh, during some of the booms and some of the recessions uh, that the UK had um, during the uh, late 80s and 90s. So um, huge experience, um, Alejandro, huge experience and firsthand experience, right? You know, uh, some of the stressful times when interest rates were at 15, 18 percent in the UK. Um, you know, how do you manage a business? How do you run a business during that uh, as well as expanding. So not just, you know, just running it, but expanding and expanding um, during some of the hard times was, was a huge, huge science and a huge art um, that, you know, I learned very much firsthand experience. And what got you into computer science? I mean, I know that there is a, a lot of pressure in, in India towards education and you see a lot of engineers and and it's amazing. I mean, it's like everyone goes to, to study computer science. I mean, was that like perhaps influenced to a certain degree by, by the culture that you went and did that? Was it, you know, you were just into problems or, or how did you get into, into essentially, you know, computer science? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think um, my parents would have loved anything that I would have done, right? If it was computer science or become a doctor or worked in the family business. I mean, I, I could tell you right now, my father um, wanted me to go into the family business. You know, even when I graduated and took my first job um, at, at Detica, um, my dad said to me, he goes, I'll give you three months and then you'll be coming to work in the family business. Um, so to be honest, my, my parents would have loved it if I went anywhere um, and did a career in anything, but they always expected me to, to either join the family business or do my own business, uh, to be fair. But how did I go into computer science? And honestly, it was through my school. I, I did incredibly well at uh, information technology, as it was called then. Um, I was learning code. I was writing code in my GCSEs, and I was very good at it. Um, I then went into uh, A-levels and did, did um, computer science as my A-level, um, and then obviously did a degree in computer science. So it wasn't necessarily I stumbled into it, but I was just very good uh, at programming uh, when I was young. Uh, I, I don't program anymore, uh, but I was, I was just very good at it and I, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed a computer doing something that I wanted it to do uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so it wasn't necessarily like breaking things together and, and, and building it in a hardware point of view, but this is, it, 
was about software. It was about getting the computer do, to do stuff. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And, and having you know a math background, having a computer science um, sort of uh, head, it was, it was really, really lovely. And that's, that's how I went into computer science. So then let's talk about finishing and getting your degree. You also got your master's. But your first experience, your first real experience in the work environment was with Detica. And I think that this for you was also a very interesting experience because you got to see the full cycle of the company. I mean, from you joining to the company being acquired for $500 million pounds. I mean, I guess that that maybe gave you insight as to, you know, how you get, you know, involved with something, how it goes for different cycles and then how it ends up, you know, getting to the finish line. So how was that experience for you? Yeah, no, it was it was a tremendous ex experience. So, you know, I joined Detica when Detica was a pretty large company. That, at that time, it was about over a thousand employees, right? And um, and I and I joined as a graduate in the graduate scheme and finishing my my my, my master's and my, my degree at Royal Holloway. And, um, you know, at that time, uh, the CEO of, of Detica is a, is a tremendous man, uh, still a tremendous man, a guy called Dr. Tom Black. And Tom uh, wanted to invest into software, into IP. And, um, you know, back in 2005, you know, Detica was a consulting, it was a services business. And he wanted um, to, to build to build IP. So at that time, my boss, uh, a guy called Imam Hock, who's my chief product officer here at Contexa, Imam was in charge to come up with new IP. He had this group called the Technology Innovation Group, TIG. He also had this group called the Data Lab. And, um, you know, I joined the Data Lab as a, as a graduate. And it was about playing with data. It was literally like, you know, we were using, um, so at that time I, I did the uh, uh, SAS, um, SAS. I learned SAS when I joined Detica. Um, I, had, I remember even like it was today, the little book of SAS, picked it up, learned it. Um, and then I was, I was coding in SAS. I found it very strange compared to, you know, I came from a C++, a C background. So learning SAS was a bit strange in, in what I've been doing at university and so on, but I loved it. You know, I, love, I loved uh, coding. And, you know, it was my first experience of working with real customer data, right, to, to find insights, right? And it was a huge experience. So, you know, my first project at Detica uh, was for a very large tier one bank here in the UK to, to find fraud, to tackle fraud. It was this fraud called sleeper fraud or advances fraud, first party fraud, some people may call it. And it was a huge insight on how do you take large clusters of data, run it through some software that you've created fundamentally, right, to find bad actors. And uh, yeah. this is before people talked about big data, big analytics, uh, AI, machine learning, human intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. This was way before then, right? We were, we, we were looking at large pools of data, bringing them together and then finding patterns and anomalies um, using uh, customer data, transactional data, and so on. So it was huge fun, and I really enjoyed it. You know, one thing that is really interesting is um, after after Detica, you did a, a you know a, a few more years uh, between SaaS, uh, EY, uh, obviously you know really getting that background. I find that you are one of those entrepreneurs that are very dangerous, but in a very good way, you know, of saying, because you're like, you were very well prepared when you started Context. I mean, not only you had the experience of understanding how to run a business from being with your dad to uh, doing computer science, like at the end of the day, uh, engineering is all about resolving problems, but then you were able to enhance that with really understanding the, you know, what it took from uh, operating to exiting with Detica, but then as well with uh, perhaps embracing even more the problem-solving aspect of it, of it with Ernst & Young. So I guess in this case, why did it take you so long to start your own business? Because you had this in the genes. What were you waiting for? Great question. And um, I, I would say th there is a number of, there's a number of uh, answers there. So I don't think if I, if I graduated at 23, 24, however old, I can't remember how, how old I was. Um, when I graduated with my master, if I did, if I tried to start my company up then, I probably would have failed. The experience I got from Detica, like you said, right, you know, I was part of a, a small group, a startup in a bigger company, right, which was Detica. Detica was then acquired by BAE. I went through that acquisition. 
I was then part of a team that acquired Norcom Technologies into um, NetReveal, where I was where I was the head of financial services, and then you know working for SaaS and Dr. Jim Goodnight, who's you know the godfather of, of analytics, learning uh, um, how to work in a much bigger corporate like um, SaaS, and then going into a big four partnership. That institutional knowledge, that corporate knowledge, that uh, governance, the rigor, uh, the experience of learning from so many wise people around me was was part of my journey and part of my success here at Contexa. You know, I, you know, my father said, you know, a, a wise man learns from his mistakes. A wiser man learns from other people's mistakes. So it was fascinating working with so many experienced people around me and learning from their experiences. And then, you know, some of it, I, I, I would I would disagree with some of it. I absolutely agree with you know I remember working when I was at Detica with a salesperson, um, and and he taught me everything what not to do in a sales process, right? And that was eye opening because I learned so much on what you should not do in a sales process. And then I learned from another sales director at um, another organisation who taught me everything I should do in a sales process. And this was great to learn. Uh, great wisdom, great experience. So I look, I, I think what took me, you know, 14, 15 years to, to start Quantexa um, was that experience I learned from different people, different organizations. And I really feel it made me the person I am today. It rounded me out. You know, if I look at Ian Y, it really rounded me out as a person, as an individual, because it gave me exposure and access to C-suite that I never could get in my previous careers because of the brand, because of the firm, it could give me that access to the top level. And that was fascinating. That was hugely fascinating, huge experience that really I, I put to work here at Contexa. So um, I, I think I, I, I did it. I did it in the right time. I also would say, look, my thought and my vision of Contexa around leveraging the best of open source, open architecture, to build context of the way I've done, um, again, wasn't, wasn't there 10 years ago. You know, if you went to a large organization and say, can you put this startup company as the nucleus to your data strategy? They would have said, no, you know, I would choose a three letter acronym company because I don't get fired for choosing that company. But now today, more and more people right. are looking for companies like a Quantexa uh, and they will take that step even on some of the most critical problems, because a lot of people have gone forward in that thinking to say, you know, the way we did it before might not be the right way. And we want a more agile, more innovative company to solve some of those problems. Of course. So then, so then in this case, let's fast forward a little bit. And uh, you are at Ernst & Young, and this is just the most immediate uh, role that you had prior to starting the business. But I understand that the a resignation phase was quite a quite an event. So tell us about that. I wouldn't say it was an event, but it was definitely something I will remember very well. So, um, I, I, <laughs> okay. I, I, so th there's a conference um, for AML anti money laundering. There, there is a conference called ACAMS, and ACAMS is the biggest uh, AML conference um, in the in the agenda. And the biggest ACAMS conference, ironically, happens in Vegas, um, in Las Vegas, and. Um, I, I, obviously, I went to um, uh, Vegas for uh, the conference. I was in, I was at EY, and obviously, leading up to going to 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 Vegas, um, you know, I had a lot of thoughts. I had, you know, could I could I now do it? Could I now be the number one and start the company? Um, you know, it takes it takes a lot of you know mental thinking before to do it, right? You know. You know, I was married. Um, I hadn't had kids then, so um, I had no you know, sort of dependencies. But you know, I just got married to my uh, my beautiful wife, um, and um, you know, um, I, I I went to Vegas and I, I met this uh, I met this lady at um, the um, the conference. Um, so you know, at the conference you have where the vendors sit down and they pitch you stuff, right? So you got the room where the conference happens, and you have another room where all the vendors are. And I met this lovely lady there who was working for this company, and I won't name the company, um, but she was working for this company, and um, the, the, the product was awful, awful product. And this lady had so much passion, 
And she was pitching to me uh, the product and the product was awful. But the passion that she was ha she had around this product was so infectious. And I sat there and I was listening to her and I was like, you know, I, I can create a better product than that and I can take that to market. And I was listening to her, I was listening to her and then, you know, obviously we didn't buy anything and, you know, unfortunately the company's no longer there. Um, but, you know, that night I, I sat down and I rang up my wife. Uh, so she was in London. Um, so I was in Vegas. I rang up my wife. It was morning there. It was coming to late in the evening, my time. And I said, look, um, darling, I, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to leave EY. I've got an idea. I've got a vision. And frankly, Alejandro, if I didn't do it then, I, I would have became a, a, an equity partner and I would have stayed at the firm, right? I wouldn't have left. And um, I was like, it's now or never. Uh, really, it's really now or never. And I had the idea and I had some financial backing myself. I had some money myself. I said, I could do this. I know the people I want. I know the people I want to get on my side because it's always about the people. And I said to, to my wife, I said, look, I'm going to do it. And, and you know, she, she's been with me since I was 16, right? So she's been through everything with me, right? And um, she said to me, absolutely, Fish, you know, you put your mind to it, you're going to be successful. And then that next morning, I called up my career mentor who was back in London. And I, and I said to my career mentor, I said, look, you know, um, this might come a bit of a surprise. Um, I'm resigning. Um, and I was on six months notice. I'll work my notice. You know, I never burn bridges. Uh, I, 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 I will, I will uh, work my six months, um, but I, I, I need to leave. I need to leave the firm. I love the firm. Um, Ian Y will have a close, uh, a close place in my heart, um, but I, I need to move on. I need to do something myself. I need to be an entrepreneur. I need to go and start my business. And then, you know, after a few meetings, you know, how, how it is, uh, the guy said, you know, come back to London, you're in Vegas. You're probably thinking, you, uh, you know, you, you're, you're in Vegas. <laughs> Don't put it all on, all, all on red or, or black or whatever it is. Don't do it. Uh, come back to London, we'll have a proper chat. We'll have a coffee. And, um, and, you know, my mind was made up, right? And um, yeah, that was it. And then came back to London, served my six yeah. months notice. And then, yeah, then started Quantex uh, in March 2016. Very cool. So what ended up being the business model of Contexta for everyone that is listening and watching to, to understand it? So, you know, what we do here at Contex Alejandro, we connect data to empower people to make better decisions. Um, the way we connect data together is a process called entity resolution and network generation. Um, we are the only platform that can do that entity resolution in both batch and real time in a transparent fashion. Entity resolution has now become almost the foundation to anything to do with digital transformation, data analytics, because if you don't understand the entity, an entity can be a customer, it can be, a, it can be your customer's customer, it could be an address, a telephone number. If you don't understand your customer, how do you do business? How do you manage your risk? How do you manage um, compliance if you don't know who that customer is or who that employee is? So very quickly in five years, entity resolution has become more and more foundational to data management, to understanding how you go to market, how you understand your risk and so on and so forth. And you know, today you know, we are supporting over 7,000 end users on our platform who are using our entity resolution to either tackle financial crime, to onboard customers, to manage their credit risk, or to prospect and go after new customers. Um, I've built it in a very open architecture fashion, so you can build APIs into you know, um, interaction systems, into, um, into other uh, analytical to tools. If you want to run your own Python on top of my entities and networks, you can go and do that. So it's very open. Uh, but it's very clear, it has the transparency, the data lineage. And because of the, obviously, the big four background I come from, being able to put these type of capabilities in a regulatory environment where you have to go through things like model risk management, model governance, again, we have done that with our platform and we have that documentation to hand. So that's what we do. Um, as I say, yeah, you know, we've been running now for over five years. You know, we've successfully raised three rounds of funding. Uh, so we've raised over just under, sorry, a hundred million dollars, and um, you know we, 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 we're winning. We're winning in the market. Uh, we have a great uh, client base uh, and an excellent, a fantastic, excellent team, and some fantastic partners and some great investors who are backing me in this journey. So it's been it's been a great you know five five plus years now. 
And how many how many people do you guys have in the business, just so that everyone listening gets an idea of the size? I mean, anything else that you can share, obviously, more than that? Yeah, no, sure. So as of 1st of April, right, so we have now over 327 employees here at Contexa. Um, we will be around 500 people by uh, this time next year. Um, so we're, we're growing at a rate. Um, you know, we, uh, as I say, you know, we, we now have over 7,000 end users. Uh, you know, during this pandemic year, we would have grown over a hundred percent, which which was fantastic. And that's not just expand to my current base; it's also we've picked up another, you know, uh, 10, 15 new logos uh, during this pr uh, process of the pandemic. So it's been a huge win in so many different ways. Um, but yeah, you know that that's that's where we are today. Uh, just 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 over three hundred twenty three twenty seven um, as of as of April. Nice growth. And uh, Bishal, you were alluding to it uh, before. I mean, you you guys have raised about 100 million, uh, a little bit over it. And uh, and essentially, I understand that, you know, maybe it just becomes a little bit more tangible and easier, maybe because of the experience to raising money. But I guess that for you, um, obviously, you were coming from the corporate world. This was your first rodeo. I'm sure that it was quite new. Uh, really raising money is, is an art at the end of the day. There's a lot of psychology and a lot of strategy involved. And even more of that, you know, more on the psychology side, when you go earlier on the financing cycles, you know, with the earlier round, with the earlier rounds, the seed rounds, you know, typically they use, they, they are more like individuals and they're like less burden on the diligence side. But when you go towards the series A, when it's more like institutional as what you're dealing with, it's a whole different ballgame. How was raising the series A for you guys? Uh, series A, it was, it was stressful. Alejandro, it was stressful. When it's your own business and you got, you know, at that time when I did Series A, we probably had about 40, 50 people in the company by then, right? It, I was bankrolling it, pretty much it was my money. Uh, we had some great two anchor clients where we were building our product uh, pretty much with it. So we had beta out of the product. Um, and and it, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. It's really hard, very emotional. You know, when it's your own money, I know I didn't take a salary for nearly 18 months, yeah? So when I started Contexa, um, you know, as I said, you know, I consulted with my wife. It's really important because it's a family decision because, you know, I was leave, leaving a big oh, four yeah. partnership on, on a very, very good uh, package um, to not take a salary for, for you know, at that time it was 12 months in my head. It was actually became 18 months uh, where I wasn't going to earn a penny. And, and, yeah. and, and perversely, I was putting money out of my own pocket into the company every month, every six months. It's a very different model. It's a very different way of thinking. And you need to set yourself up to think like that. Which was very very different for me so you know um series a you know that journey you know end to end was three months um which which was pretty quick actually from getting the deck out um uh, speaking to a number of investors um you know i got in series a i got four term sheets uh signed term sheets i i took two uh, I, I selected two um nice. for my series a you know some of the learnings right you know um don't go all in very quickly with one right you know you have to do, do not there was one vc i remember uh, basically said vish you, you're nowhere in the process till you've got a signed term sheet in your hand and that stayed in my head right I'm, i could have lots of great conversations with lots of great vcs means nothing till i had that signed term sheet in my hand right so um it was a very good conversation i had this way you put it in my head means nothing those good conversations mean nothing till you get a signed term sheet that's the first point the second point you know don't get too excited with good conversations. You know, there's a lot of people out there that will burn time, burn your time. And what they're doing, they're fact finding about the market, about your, your client base, around your go to market. They are fact finding. Those are not good conversations. They are conversations that are great for the, for the VC, but it's not necessarily good for you because you're not getting a check at the end of that process. You know, do not be afraid to ask the difficult conversation. Right. Am I the shape and fit of the companies you invested? What are the companies you invested? Um, what shape did you come in at Series A? You know, are you expecting ARR at Series A? Are you expecting a full go to market at, a, uh, at Series A? Do not be afraid to ask these questions because you might think you're having a great conversation. The VC is just fact finding, right? Or, you know, they, they, they might like you, but you're too early. You're not the shape that they need. Ask the question. Because uh, you can burn lots of cycles. You know, 
when I was doing series A, you know, it's the first time in my life I actually got hives. I was getting these rashes and it was stress because, you know, you're, you're running the business. It's your own money in the business and you're trying to sell the business to these VCs, right? Um, it's, it's very stressful. I remember series A like it was yesterday. Um, it was very stressful. And, um, you know, don't, do not get down if you're not getting the term sheets. You know, if you believe in your business and you believe in your, your market, you will find that investor. But do not get down. You know, you don't take it personally. Just because it's not for them, it doesn't mean it's not for somebody else. Don't take it personally. Um, you know, when it's your own business, it's very easy to take it personally. Very easy. Of course it is because it's your baby, right? You create it. Yeah. Uh, but don't take it personally because it's not for somebody else. It'll be for somebody else. Um, so that was really important for me to learn as I was going through that process. But, you know, I have a lot of lot of wise people around me that helped me, guided me. Don't be afraid to ask the question. Don't be afraid to go and speak to people who've already done it before. Don't, don't be humble about it during that process. Um, I did that. I spoke to a lot of people who've gone through that process before I did. Um, you know, so that was all, all very good. But, you know, I, I ran my first Series A. I got, you know, I'd say four term sheets. I, I chose two. Um, it, was, it was brilliant. I loved it. Um, it was stressful, very stressful. And why, why, why did you pick? Why did you pick the? Why did you pick the two term sheets that you that you ended up picking? So the first one is very important to me is chemistry. Money's money, right? You, you, there's a lot of money out there. You can get the money. Chemistry. Um, so Albion, um, Ed Lascelles, who's the main partner there, who's still on my board today at Series C. We just got along. You know, it, you know, he made the process very simple. We spoke like adults. There was no, you know, my spreadsheet says no sort of conversation, right? It was very, very business related. Right. It was very, uh, he was very humble during the process. He gave the case studies where he'd invested and did well. He also told me stuff that didn't go well, which I love to hear, right? It's always about, it's always sunny. You know, sometimes it rains. What do you do when it rains? Um, you know, so Ed, Ed, was, Ed was amazing, right? And um, he, he also had one of his uh, other partners there, a guy called Rob, who was fantastic. Uh, they both came in um, to the meetings. Um, the chemistry was just good. I also liked his firm, you know, Albion. You know, I met uh, Will, um, who, who was the, um, he wasn't the managing partner then, he's the managing partner now. Another very, very, um, you know, decent guy, you know, just, just, told me as it was and again very humble um you know just, i said the chemistry was right the experience was there no messing about you know it was this is my term sheet this is how it looks this is what it is um loved it absolutely loved it really really good guys um really enjoyed the time and i still enjoy the time with them you know um very good and my and my and my other investor was hsbc bank um so hsbc bank was one of my first anchor clients um, I, I have great relationships with the bank. I still do have great relationships with the bank. At that time, um, you know, we were talking to some of the financial crime guys, the investment um, uh, managers there. We had a very good relationship at the time of their CEO, a guy called uh, Stuart Gulliver, uh, an amazing person. Um, so, you know, we knew the investment committee well. Um, the chemistry again was right. They got my vision, really important. They got the vision. They were going to be a great also R&D partner to help me build out um, the platform. A great a great um, brand, HSBC Bank PLC, um, a great brand to have behind you. Um, you know, it, it was just, just all correct. So we chose HSBC um, and we chose um, Albion. And I'm delighted to have both of them, even till today, they, they contributed incredibly well in my Series C. They, they both did Pro Rata Plus um, Plus. So, you know, it's been a great partnership with them. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, delighted to still say they're my partners today. That's amazing, you know, and, and obviously when, when you're starting to add those big names, definitely they open doors, you know, just by dropping those names, which is uh, super helpful. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, one of the questions that I want to ask you here <laughs> is, imagine you go to sleep tonight, uh, Vishal, and you wake up in a world where the vision of context is fully, fully realized. What does that world look like? God willing, uh, Alejandro, that that will happen. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I, I remember once I was very young, right? Um, I was 24, 25. I did my first international trip at Detica. 
they sent me um so this is the first time i got on a plane for business uh not for a holiday right and i went to um i went to edinburgh um and uh, i got a flight from heathrow went to edinburgh came back and I, you know in in london heathrow i don't know if it's still there i haven't traveled obviously for the pandemic for, for a very long time i i landed in heathrow and i got into a taxi um it wasn't uber then it was a it was a taxi that you would call on your mobile phone to collect you um and when you come out of Heathrow, um, there is a there is a advertising stand. Uh, it's like a billboard, and um, it's Oracle's. And Oracle says, you know, out of the twenty largest uh, clients or institutions in the world, uh, nineteen of them use Oracle. You know, I looked at that as a twenty year old, and I went, I would love it if I could one day say, truthfully say that the top, out of the top 10 institutions in the world, nine use Contexa, or the top 20, 19 use Contexa. And God willing, we're getting there, right? We're on that journey, we're on there, that vision is coming true. More and more people are using context to empower them to make better decisions. More and more uh, organizations are combining both human intelligence and artificial intelligence on top of context to empower them to make better decisions. And that context is Quantexa. We are the best at building context. And the way we've architected allows people to put that into machine learning algorithms, uh, to put them into uh, business rules, to combine it, to empower people to make those better decisions. So how will I feel when I can actually put the billboard up and say, um, you know, nine out of 10, 19 out of 20 use Quantexa? I will still wake up in the morning and have my breakfast. I will still go to, I will still have dinner, you know, I will still have dinner. Um, and I will, uh, you know, in, in India, um, in, in, in Indian food, we have this thing called rotis, uh, chapati. I will still only eat two. I'm not going to eat three. I can't eat three. And I won't eat one because I get hungry. I'm still going to only eat two. Um, it will be satisfaction to have that. Um, but it won't change me. It will be, I'm still the, the Londoner that did this um, and I look forward to having that vision true and I will get there, uh, we will get there. Uh, but it's not just about the, the big the big organizations, you know, a number of smaller organizations with just 5,000 customers or 2,000 customers or organizations with just 10 employees are using Quantexa to empower them to make better decisions. So, you know, my vision is not just for the large organization, which I've scaled the business to do that, but it's also the small organization who have 10 or 20 employees who are not the HSBC Bank PLC, but they're also using my platform um, to empower them to make those better decisions. That's amazing. I, I love that, uh, Vishal. So imagine now, let's say I put you in a time machine. And this is the question that I typically ask the guests that come on the show. I put you in a time machine and, and we're going back in time. And we're giving you the chance to have a conversation with your younger self. That is the younger Vishal. That is maybe like making, after like hanging up that phone call you know, that you made to your wife saying, I have an idea, I want to do this thing. Imagine for one second, you're able to sit down with maybe that Vishal that just arrived to the room, sat on the bed, and just hung up the phone, you know, and then started to think about, you know, what could this next phase look like? If you could have a chat with that younger self and give yourself one piece of advice before launching the business, what would that be and why, given what you know now, Vishal? Wow. Wow. Great question. And there's, there is a lot I could say. But the one thing that comes to my mind as you say that, uh, and what I would tell younger Vishal um, who was um, starting Quantexa five years ago. Um, listen to what your dad said to you. And I'll tell you what he said. Uh, my dad said, when I, started, when I went to go and start my company, um, when I went to go and start Quantexa, he said, uh, Vish, he goes, when you go for a hunt, you don't prepare yourself that you're going to hunt for one thing. You prepare yourself that you're going to hunt for many things. So you prepare yourself for all outcomes, for, for not just being successful in one thing, but a hundred things. You, you prepare yourself in that way. 
when I started Quantexa, I went in with, you know, some of my own money. Um, I think if I went in with more of my own money and backed myself even more, um, maybe I could have delayed Series A for by six months. Maybe I could have done that and bankrolled it a bit more. Um, maybe I could have gone a bit more faster, a bit quicker. Maybe. Um, these are all things. If I, you know, it's, it's, it's always easy to look at it on hindsight, right? You know, back yourself harder, Vish. But you, I put a quarter of a million pounds of my own money behind me. Um, and then I put more money behind me after that. Maybe I could put all of it up front at the beginning when I started in March 2016. And I didn't drip it during the year. Maybe I could have gone faster. Um, so going back to what my dad said, you know, if I would have hunted and gone bigger and more aggressive, maybe we could have gone a bit faster. But, you know, on hindsight, I don't think I would have done it because I was, you know, calculated risks. Right? I was doing calculated risks. Don't don't sprint before you haven't crawled or started to run. Um, but on hindsight, I would have gone faster, quicker. That's amazing. I love it, Michelle. So for the people that are listening, what is the best way for them to reach out and say hi? Uh, but, um, to be honest, I, I don't do a lot of social media. The best way to say hi is on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I watch my LinkedIn. I respond back to most of my messages on LinkedIn. Uh, just look up, look me up on Vishal Mary at LinkedIn and um, I will respond. Amazing. Well, Vishal, thank you so much for being on the Dealmaker Show today. Thank you for having me and God bless you and the family.